This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network, and as always, I'm your host, Jesse Tapia. All right, for today's show, we're going to be talking Nick Foles versus Tom Brady. Just kidding, we're not going to be talking about that. So we have two more weeks to the Super Bowl. We're not going to waste all our time on it on this show. Obviously, we have two weeks to spread it out, you know? But we're going to be talking AFC Championship game and NFC Championship game. Pats, once again, I mean... I might have to just have to talk about how they kind of ruined the NFL. They're pretty much the standard for excellence now, and it's kind of unfair, actually. All right, so we're going to be talking about the game between the Jags and Pats. Talk about pretty much do like, like I said, like how we do it um, all the time. Um, give the score, do the stats, give some analysis, and then we're going to talk about what's next for the Jaguars. And probably going to get a few words in there about the uh, about the Patriots because this is honestly ridiculous what they've been doing. All right, like I said, we'll do the same thing for the NFC Championship game. Talk about that blowout. Talk about that disappointing performance that Minnesota turned in the week after they got that miracle uh, miracle win against New Orleans. And we're going to talk a little bit about why I shouldn't have been all in on Minnesota, given that they won a game just because the safety of New Orleans couldn't make a tackle or got there too early. All right, so we'll be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the NBA scores for a Monday night. And for the fourth segment, we're going to be talking... The Cavs, still more drama going on there, and I don't see how how this gets fixed, honestly. So we're going to be talking about that again. And the Cavs are just, this is ridiculous, just, I'm going to say a little bit on it right now. It's just ridiculous how it's all, like, turned out to be, like, how it's all ended up so far. All right, everyone wants to say, oh, they have LeBron. Like, we got to stop using the excuse, oh, LeBron is on that team. They're going to get to the finals. That's not the case right now. All right, this feels different, and it's going to be different, I feel. All right, so you know what? We're going to be talking about that. We're going to talk about Kawhi Leonard, what's going on with him and the Spurs right now. It's kind of weird to be seeing, like, for them to be in the news and not to be good because it's been the Spurs, you know? It's like seeing something wrong with Tom Brady and uh, New England. Actually, we got that about a week ago on Friday. Yeah, last was it, wasn't this two weeks, uh, two Fridays ago, I think it was, where ESPN pointed out there, published that article how Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, Robert Kraft all had some tensions between them. Really, I mean, I don't get, like, nothing's happened since it, so now I'm starting to not believe it. I mean, the only way the article becomes kind of completely true is if Bill Belichick leaves after this year, but I have no clue what's going to happen, so yeah, we're going to be talking LeBron, Cavs, talking about Kevin Love a little bit, talking Kawhi and the Spurs, and then we'll be making my picks for, what is it, today's Tuesday? Yeah, for Tuesday's game, NBA games, got uh, Celtics, Lakers, and a couple others going on tonight, so... Let's just get it started with the Jacksonville Jaguars and New England Patriots. Of course, as we've all known, Patriots come out on top in this one, all right? I made my pick. um, I picked the Jaguars in this game. Obviously, Tom Brady heard it, saw it, or something because, I mean, Jacksonville played good in this game. Actually, let me give you the score and the stats first before I get into it. All right, so Patriots beat Jags, the Jags, uh, 24-20. Blake Bortles completed 23 out of 36 passing uh, passes. Had 293 yards passing, one touchdown, only took off, didn't even take off with the ball at all um, to scramble. Leonard Fournette had 24 carries, 76 yards and a touchdown. TJ Yeldon, 5 carries, 25 yards. Alan Hearns, 6 receptions for 80 yards. Corey Grant had 3 receptions for 59 yards. I think he's going to be a good receiver going forward in the next few years. Marquise Lee had 4 catches for 41 yards. And then Keenan Cole had 2 catches for 37 yards. As for those New England Patriots. You had Tom Brady with uh, completed 26 out of his 38 passes, 290 yards, two touchdowns. Deion Lewis, nine carries, 34 yards. What do you do on the as far as, far as receiving? He got seven catches for 32 yards. Uh, Rex Perkhead came back in this game, only had one carry for five yards. James White, three carries, four yards, one touchdown. Also had three catches for 22 yards. Brandon Cooks, good game from him, six receptions, 100 yards. 
Danny Amendola, seven receptions, 84 yards, two touchdowns. And then you had Rob Gronkowski before he left the game with a concussion. He only had one catch for 21 yards. Really wasn't doing much, but didn't really matter. Patriots pretty much had the, I don't want to say it was like, I don't know. This game was weird, okay? So it starts out, Patriots drive down the field, then kick a field goal, 3-0, okay? Next drive, Jacksonville goes down the field, scores a touchdown, 7-3. Eventually, the game becomes 14-3, and then it's like, oh, this is Pittsburgh all over again. Jacksonville's out to a fast start, and it was exactly like the Pittsburgh game, honestly, if you watch both games, all right? Jacksonville's off to a hot start. They're up by double score or two scores. I think in Pittsburgh, they're up by three scores, but nonetheless, I mean, it's not looking good for uh, New England. They get the ball near the end of the first half, and Brady drives them all the way down the field, and they score a touchdown. I think it was uh, James White who scored the touchdown at the end of the first half. All right, like I said, just like the Pittsburgh game. Pittsburgh, I mean, Pittsburgh was a little, di- a little different because Ben Roethlisberger didn't march him down the field. I mean, it was fourth and 11. Uh, I think they were on like the 44-yard line or somewhere around there. And one of the Jack safeties messed up, let Martavis Bryant get behind him, and that's how they scored at the end of the half. But nonetheless, both teams scored touchdowns at the end of the half, and I'm sure most fans thought, well, Jackson was going to end up losing this one. And I'm sure most figured, I mean, that Jackson would lose this game even without uh, them scoring at the end of the first half. But nonetheless, I mean, when Tom Brady goes, drives him down the field, and they score, it's pretty much so. Jacksonville's in trouble. There was a moment right there. And sure enough, I mean, it didn't even like, it didn't even like, the, the implosion didn't even happen until the fourth quarter. All right, because Jacksonville ends up going up. Uh, they kick two field goals. They're up twenty to ten at uh, one point in the fourth. There's about I don't know eleven minutes left in the fourth quarter. They run a New England runs a trick play. Brady throws it to Danny Amendola. Danny Amendola throws it across the field to Deion Lewis behind the line of scrimmage, and Deion Lewis catches it, takes off down the field, and then you see Miles Jack like a bullet coming out of nowhere. Tackles Deion Lewis, pretty much steals his lunch, meaning he takes the football away from him. And this was a big thing right here. All right. Miles Jack obviously causes the fumble, takes it, and the refs blow the play dead right there as soon as Miles Jack has the ball. Of course, like they ruled it a fumble, but I don't think he was ever touched by Deion Lewis. And if the refs don't blow the play dead, I'm, th- I'm thinking Miles Jack takes it all the way down for a touchdown because there was no one around him really. But for the refs to blow the play, um, the play dead, I mean, as soon as uh, Jack comes up with the ball, I mean, you really can't do much after that. So I kind of hurt Jacksonville there. But nonetheless, I mean, Jacksonville couldn't do anything with the ball after that. Blake Bortles just really, like last week in the fourth quarter against Pittsburgh, Blake Bortles played extremely well. All right, made big throws, got him down the field so they, they'd be in position to score. This fourth quarter, that just wasn't the case at all. So like I said, Miles Jack gets the fumble. Uh, Jacksonville can't capitalize. No one gets the ball back. Tom Brady throws a... Touchdown to Danny Amendola, which makes it uh, 17-20. Then it's like, oh, Jacksonville's in trouble. This one's over. And like I said, just Blake Bortles couldn't get Jacksonville's offense down the field at all. So eventually, Tom Brady gets the ball with about six minutes left, I believe. Drives him down the field again. And boom, Danny Amendola, game-winning touchdown, 24-20. Again, same thing. Bortles gets the ball back. Nothing happens. Stephon Gilmore makes a good play on fourth down. Game over. And I was surprised. All right. Everyone's favorite uh, monotone person, Bill Belichick. I mean, Bill Belichick never shows emotion, but when Stephon Gilmore jumped up and batted that ball down, you saw um, Bill Belichick raise his hand high, was waving it all around, would say, yeah, yeah, we did it, or whatever. So, I can't remember exactly what he said, but you could read his lips, and he was saying something like that. And then him and Matt Patricia, who I think is going to be heading to Detroit to coach them, were all hugging it out, all smiles. And I was like, I've never seen this from Bill Belichick. It almost made me kind of laugh. Because like I said, I mean, Bill Belichick has just been someone who's never really showed any type of emotion. But nonetheless, here he was, all excited because they beat the Jags. And that probably has to do more with the fact that, you know what, the Jags are a tough team to beat. And the Patriots just pulled out the perfect game plan. I mean, the Jags nearly played a perfect game, but they just couldn't capitalize when they needed to. A lot of bad um, bad penalties. I think Jacksonville had around over 100 penalty yards. can't remember exactly how many penalties they had. And the Patriots had one penalty for 10 yards. People want to say that the refs are in the Patriots' back pocket, but I mean, how off? Like how how much more can we dislike the Patriots and try to do that? Maybe they're just a great team. Well, not maybe they are. They're just a well-disciplined team, and it just they know how to play football the right way. Like I said in the beginning of the podcast, I mean the Patriots have pretty much ruined football almost, not in a bad way, but to where you expect excellence constantly out of your teams now. All right, the Patriots. What is this? Their eighth straight AFC Championship game. That's ridiculous. 
All right, this is going to be their eighth Super Bowl, I think, Super Bowl appearance since Brady and Belichick have been together. I mean, if you get down to it, if Eli Manning just doesn't make those uh, crazy throws, Tom Brady's already got seven Super Bowl rings. Think about that. We are two Eli Manning games away from ha- seeing Tom Brady having seven Super Bowls. It's ridiculous. I probably didn't word that last sentence right, but nonetheless, you get what I'm saying. All right. So like I said, I mean, Tom Brady could have seven Super Bowls if not for Eli. But now, I mean, he's going to be going to Minnesota to get his sixth against Nick Foles. I'm not going to say too much about that game yet. We got two weeks to talk about it. Maybe we'll talk some Pro Bowl this week. Yeah, you guys know how I feel about the Pro Bowl. You guys know how I feel about any All-Star game. I can't stand the All-Star game. But nonetheless, now Jacksonville out of the playoffs, back at home, where they usually have been in the last decade or so. So what's next for Jacksonville? I think that this team is good enough to get back to the AFC Championship next year, possibly even make it back to the Super Bowl. Obviously, this is a way too early prediction, a way too early thought. But the only way they get back is if they get rid of the quarterback and bring in a new one. All right? I get Blake Bortles played well in these playoffs. I get that he did his job. Okay? I get that this was probably his best season. But if you look at the numbers, Blake Bortles' best season was just an average season by a quarterback. Okay? Blake Bortles wasn't really too special. I think Blake Bortles now is going to end up being the new Josh McCown. All right, eventually Josh McCown's going to be out the league. Bortles is going to be a guy who goes into bad teams and starts for them until their younger quarterback is ready. All right, Blake Bortles isn't like terrible. I don't know. Blake Bortles is pretty bad, I think. Like Blake Bortles, like Blake Bortles is weird. I mean, the guy's been in the league for four years, and how like how often can you like how much longer can you wait on him to become something? It's been four years. I mean, a quarterback usually should get three years tops. And then if after three years, if you don't think he's it, then get rid of him. Start over. All right. There's going to be a bunch of quarterbacks, too, that are going to be available um, come this offseason. I mean, guys like Sam Bradford, Alex Smith, Teddy Bridgewater, most likely. Maybe even a guy like Eli Manning, if Pat Shermer, who's going to be the new Giants head coach, wants to bring Case Keenum over to uh, New York and tell Eli, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. All right. I mean, because... That's a possibility right there for the Giants. Them bringing back, them bringing Case Keenum over, and drafting a guy like Saquon Barkley with that number two pick. I mean, I wouldn't. That's not something that's too far off in the realm of possibility. All right. So like I'm saying, even with Jack, with the Jacksonville Jaguars, you just need someone that's a little bit better than Blake Bortles. Someone that you don't have to win in spite of. You know, I've always said it this season. Whenever the Jaguars are playing on Sundays, they're not just playing the, op- uh, the opposing team. They're playing Blake Bortles too. The guy just isn't good enough to be playing on a team like this. All right, he's going to hold him back. And you know what? If they have a better quarterback, maybe they win this game. All right, like even a guy like Alex Smith. People have their thoughts about him, but Alex Smith had his best season this year. And all around, if you think about it, this Jacksonville Jaguars team at every unit, every position is better than the Kansas City Chiefs. You put a guy like Alex Smith here, he's not going to turn the ball over. He's not going to lose you a game. He's going to do enough on offense to where you guys can be comfortable. And then all you got to do is just worry about that defense putting the game away. All right, you don't have to worry about him throwing a bunch of picks like Blake Bortles. You don't have to worry about him not being able to make the right throws. Because Alex Smith, is a not, he's a nice quarterback. He's an above average quarterback, I think. He's a whole lot better than Joe Flacco. And Joe Flacco's probably got one of the worst contracts in the league for a quarterback. All right, so I mean, a guy like Alex Smith would work out perfectly in Jacksonville. Kirk Cousins, I don't think would. I mean, I don't think Jacksonville wants to pay that guy that much when you guys got a, when you got a young team already, and in a few years you're gonna have to pay those guys. But you're gonna be handicapped because you have a guy like Kirk Cousins, you're paying a bunch of money to. So, if I'm the Jags, Kirk Cousins is my guy. I've been throwing around the name of Lamar Jackson a few times. I'm not sure if that's gonna happen. I don't think Jacksonville wants to go with a rookie quarterback as uh, someone who's going to lead their team going forward. So I doubt that happens. But if I had to make my pick between it, like if I was the GM, I'm going Alex Smith. All right. Again, I mean, it'd be um, off of a trade, but I don't think, like, that's perfect. Just do a straight swap. Alex Smith for Blake Bortles. Okay. If Andy Reid, I mean, no, that wouldn't happen. But nonetheless, I mean, like I said, I mean, get rid of Blake Bortles, bring in Alex Smith, or even Sam Bradford. Just bring in someone that's not going to lose you a game. All right. Because this team, this is, the Jack, this is the Jacksonville um, Jaguars' new window right here. It's just starting this year. All right, this is their chance to go out and win Super Bowls. Their team is good enough. Just get a quarterback better than Blake Bortles. You do that, they'll be in good shape. And you know what? I'm not even sure if they're going to bring back Allen Robinson next year. I think he's. Um, this was the final year of his deal. I think he, what was it, tore his ACL, tore his Achilles in training camp or week one. 
I mean, you got Alan Hearns, Corey Grant, Marquise Lee, Keenan Cole, and D.D. Westbrook. All right. Those guys could have been a whole, lot better, a whole lot better than what they were, but we all know who was playing quarterback. So I'm not even sure if you want to bring back Allen Robinson next year. If I'm the Jags, maybe, I don't know, can they franchise him next year? If they can, then I do that. But if not, mm, kick him to the curb unless he's cheap. All right, so like I said, the New England Patriots won 24-20, currently ruining football, currently setting such a high standard for excellence that no one else can reach. So, I mean, good on them back in the Super Bowl. I mean, Tom Brady, I'm not sure when he's going to retire. I said that it'd probably be three more years tops that he has. I mean, the guy's gotten better every year. So, I mean, he pretty much just owns the National Football League. But, like I said, we're going to have to wait and see. All right, so next up, we're going to be talking Vikings-Eagles, talking about those two teams, talking about what's next for the Vikings, what they got to do at quarterback, and we're going to talk about Nick Foles a bit. So, stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Sports Podcast. All right. Last segment, we talked Patriots Jags. We talked uh, 24 20, Patriots going back to the Super Bowl. What was that? Their eighth straight AFC Championship game, I think it was. Seventh or eighth straight, nonetheless, doesn't matter. Patriots have owned the AFC for so long. I mean, I've watched them pretty much destroy my favorite team's division year after year. You give me no hope. So, I mean, I've just learned to come in. Like, I don't hate the Patriots anymore. All right. It's like LeBron James. I don't hate LeBron James. You just got to respect what they're doing now. I mean, it's ridiculous how long they've been able to sustain this. Like, no team has ever done that, ever. All right? I think the next comparable f sports franchise is the San Antonio Spurs. They've been good since about, like, 1998. But they're not getting back to the Western Conference Finals year after year like the Patriots are getting back to the AFC Championship. All right? I think the Spurs do have five championships within that 1998 to 2017 span. But, I mean, Patriots got five championships from 2001 to 2017. And they might even make it six. So, I mean, it's just ridiculous what the Patriots have done. Like, there's no been no sports team, professional sports team ever in the history that has done this. I guess you could say out of the four major sports. I'm sure there's a soccer team out there that's sustained this kind of dominance. But, nonetheless, Patriots, I mean, they own the NFL. Tom Brady, I mean, just can't hate it anymore. Just learn to respect it. If you're a guy who just hasn't been able to enjoy football, hasn't been able to enjoy football because of the Patriots' dominance. I mean, it's only a few more years, I think. So, either way, like I said, Patriots are going to be in the Super Bowl. Jags, they could be back in the AFC Championship next year. Could be Super Bowl contenders next year, but they got to fix that quarterback problem. All right, so now we're talking NFC Championship. We're talking Philadelphia Eagles, Minnesota Vikings. We're talking Eagles 38. We're talking Vikings 7. All right. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Minnesota did not show up for this game at all. Terrible. All right. I'm not sure if it was pretty much the factor of coming off such a big win in front of your home fans, scoring at the very, at literally the very last play of the game. And I'm not sure if that was just in their, in their head all week or they just couldn't come back from that, like couldn't top it, you know? Because, like, I mean, this performance, yeah, I understand Philly winning. I completely get that. I mean, it wasn't far off or anything like that. But for Philly to go out and drop 38 points on this Vikings defense that was supposed to be a top three defense, I guess you could say, in the league, that's ridiculous. I mean, Case Keenum in this game completed only 28 out of his 48 passes, 271 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. 
Jarek McKinnon, 10 carries, 40 yards, did have 11 receptions for 86 yards. Latavius Murray, only 6 carries in this one, 18 yards. Stephon Diggs had 8 catches for 70 yards. Jarius Wright, 3 catches, 51 yards. And then you had Adam, Adam Thielen with 28 yards, 3 catches, 28 yards. Kyle Rudolph only had one catch in this game. That was for 25 yards. That was for the only touchdown in the game. All right, there was a point where he's like, ooh, the Vikings are going to have a good chance at winning this. Yeah, that was literally right after they scored the opening touchdown of the game. After that, Philly comes back, scores, and that's all she wrote right there. I mean, Vikings had no chance in this one whatsoever. All right, you had Nick Foles in here. Remember, I was telling you guys that I don't think Nick Foles can throw the ball deep, and I mean, he completely shut me up right there. I mean, he had he completed 26 out of his 30 passes, 352 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Jay Ajay, 18 carries, 73 yards. The Garrett Blunt did his job, six carries, 21 yards, two, one touchdown. Zach Ertz had eight receptions for 93 yards. Alshon Jeffrey, five receptions for 85 yards, two touchdowns. Torrey Smith, five catches, 69 yards, and a touchdown. And you had Nelson Aguilar with three catches for 59 yards. And then Jay Ajay also um, contributing on the receiving end. He had three catches for 26 yards. So, I mean, the Eagles, like I said, I wasn't sure that they'd be able to win. I picked the Vikings as my team, went 0-2 this weekend. Oh, well, it is what it is. But I thought the Vikings would be able to, would be able to take away the underneath routes. And they couldn't do that. And worst, like, worst case scenario happened. Vic, Nick Foles was throwing the ball deep, and he was completing his passes. He was accurate. I mean, I think before Sunday's game against Minnesota, Nick Foles only had, com- had one completion over 20 yards in the playoffs. All right, so, I mean, Nick Foles, like me thinking that Nick Foles couldn't throw the ball deep wasn't just something I was saying. It was the truth. All right, but nonetheless, he comes out here. And he lights up Minnesota's defense. It was ridiculous. Like I said, I mean, Minnesota jumped out to a 7-0 lead. Philly answers right back. I mean, let's let's go through let's go through the scoring summary here. I mean, it was ridiculous. Like Philly's offense was doing. They were throwing um, flea flicker, flea flicker touchdowns. Like it was just ridiculous. They could do whatever they wanted, and Minnesota just couldn't stop it whatsoever. All right, so like I said, I mean, Minnesota jumps out to a 7-0 lead. Kyle Rudolph catches the 25-yard touchdown pass from Case Keenum. And then Patrick Robinson, 50-yard interception return for a touchdown, 7-7. Second quarter comes. The Garrett Blunt, 11-yard touchdown run, makes a 14-7 Philly. Then Alshon Jeffrey, 53-yard touchdown pass from Nick Foles. Literally, Jeffrey was wide open. Terrence Newman, old man, get him out. All right, makes a 21-7 Philly. Then Jake Elliott hits a 38-yard field goal before this, like right as the second quarter ends, 24-7 Philly. Third quarter comes that flea flicker touchdown pass from Nick Foles to Torrey Smith for 41 yards, 31-7 Philly. And then Alshon Jeffrey catches another five-yard touchdown pass from Nick Foles in the fourth quarter, which, which makes it 38-7 Philly. And the worst part about this was that Minnesota couldn't even get anything going in garbage time. They couldn't get any garbage time scores whatsoever. I mean. At least Tennessee, again, and their blowout against New England in the AFC Divisional round. I mean, Tennessee got a touchdown towards the end of the game, I mean, to make themselves feel better. That's a nice little garbage time touchdown right there. But Minnesota had no chance whatsoever in this one to come back or even. They just didn't show up. It was ridiculous. It was just Minnesota had three turnovers. It was just all bad for them. All right, Philly dominated on every single side of the ball, whether it be offense, defense, special teams. They did whatever they wanted. All right, those Philly fans are going crazy. Philly fans kind of disappointed me. I know a few Philly fans love them to death, but I mean, as far as fans in Philly, they're ruthless and they're just crazy as it is. All right, but nonetheless, I mean, the Vikings are going home. Philly's going to the Super Bowl rematch of the 2004 Super Bowl. I think it was between the Eagles and uh, Patriots. I'm saying I think it was because I'm pretty almost. I think it was 2004. Was 2003? Was that Jake DeLone versus Tom Brady? I think so. I might have to double check this, but. Yeah, I'm almost positive 2004 was the Eagles versus uh, Patriots. That's the Terrell Owens right there when he came back. He didn't have like a broken foot or something like that. Comes out in the Super Bowl and just lights up the Patriots defense. And I think Adam Vinatieri won that game for the Patriots at the end. But nonetheless, we got a Super Bowl rematch. But let's talk Vikings for a bit. All right. I mean, did well. Probably overachieved this season. I mean, when Sam Bradford went out early on in the... I think it was the first game of the season. He went out injured. Case Keenum steps up. I mean, no one expects ex- expected, I'm sure, Case Keenum to go out and lead the Vikings to the NFC Championship. I didn't, and like I said, I'm almost positive the majority of fans and people around the league didn't either. But nonetheless, the guy goes out there, and he puts up an MVP-type season, right? He did lead the Vikings to the NFC Championship. Yeah, that defense played well, but Case Keenum played just as well. Finished the season with over 3,500 3, yards, 22 touchdowns, and 7 interceptions. All right. Case Keenum was on his way to getting paid, big time. 
And this game right here was just the worst possible thing that could have happened to Case Keenum, all right? Case Keenum, if he would have threw for around 300 yards, had a couple of touchdowns, maybe a pick or no picks at all, Case Keenum gets paid in the offseason. But now, since everyone was waiting for Case Keenum to fall off, I remember, all right, throughout the season, it's pretty much, oh, Case Keenum can't sustain this. Case Keenum can't keep it going. Case Keenum kept it going. I mean, even Mike Zimmer just couldn't, when Teddy Bridgewater came back, just wouldn't... Um, give a true answer on who the starting quarterback was going to be week in and week out. I mean, I'm sure we knew it was Case Keenum, but nonetheless, I mean, Zimmer just wouldn't say it. So everyone was waiting for Case Keenum to uh, drop drop his play and play terrible. And it stinks because it came in the NFC Championship game, and this is going to be the, the most recent thing in people's minds, watching Case Keenum play terrible against the Eagles. All right, The Eagles do have the second-best defense in the league right behind Jacksonville's, I feel. Got the best defensive line, uh, arguably, but I mean, now... What's next for Case Keenum? Does he go back to Minnesota? I mean, he's. I was thinking Case Keenum probably could have got anywhere from fifteen to twenty million a year before this game, even if he didn't go to the Super Bowl. But like I said, this game was just worst case scenario. Worst case scenario for him. Now he's probably going to get somewhere between uh, ten and twelve million. Won't get fifteen million, that's for sure, unless some team wants to overpay for him. But I doubt that. And there's really only two viable options, I think, for Case Keenum. It's either to stay in Minnesota or Go to New York with Pat Shermer, but I'm not even sure what Pat Shermer wants to do since he's got Eli Manning over there. Giants currently got the second pick in the draft, and maybe Pat Shermer wants to uh, draft his own quarterback. Probably a guy like Josh Rosen or possibly Sam Darnold, depending on who the uh, Browns pick with the number one pick. I mean, they might have their ch um, choice at both because it's looking like uh, the Browns might end up taking Josh Allen. I think it's between Josh Allen and Sam Darnold right now for the Browns, but we got to wait for all that, see what teams think of uh, these players after the combine. But like I said, I mean, what does Pat Shermer want to do? You want to bring back a, you want to bring a thirty year old quarterback with you. You're gonna to have to give at least four years, forty million. I'm thinking for a contract at least. I mean, again, the guy's thirty years old. I mean, how? I mean, the guy's getting old. He hasn't really done anything in his NFL career so far. So, do you want to do that, or you want to bring in a guy like Josh Rosen to learn under Eli Manning for a bit? And if I'm the Vikings, I mean, what do you do with Case Keenum, Teddy Bridgewater, and Sam Bradford? All right. I mean, honestly, my my take. I think Sam Bradford's gone. I think he's the odd man out right there. Sam Bradford could probably end up with a team like Buffalo or even Arizona, I think. I think it's more going to be Buffalo unless it's going to be... It depends. Alex Smith, I think him, he's going to end up in uh, Arizona or, Arizona or uh, Jacksonville, I think. And Sam Bradford, I mean, he has his choice at, uh, I think it'll be Arizona or uh, Buffalo. I think it's going to end up being Buffalo because Buffalo, really, they have the number 21 and number 22 pick. So... I mean, they're not going to be able to waste it on a quarterback unless they go with a guy like Mason Rudolph. But, I mean, that's been my uh, late um, first-round pick for a lot of teams who might need a quarterback in the future, teams like New Orleans or maybe even New England. But I'm not sure what Buffalo wants to do. But if I'm them, them I'm going Sam Bradford. He's the safest option. So, I mean, like I said, Sam Bradford's gonna, probably going to end up being gone. So that leaves it between Case Keenum and Teddy Bridgewater. What do the Vikings do there? All right. Teddy Bridgewater, remember, pretty much, Blew out his knee completely. Almost lost his uh, lower half of his leg. All right, Hasn't been in the league for two years. He's going to be two and a half by the time um, next season comes around. And really didn't show exactly. Like he showed an upside when he was playing. But just wasn't like a sure thing. You know like he was showing upside. Looking like he's going to make that next jump. To becoming a good quarterback in the NFL. But then boom. Tears his ACL. Blows his knee out. And now we wait. All right, right now, Teddy Bridgewater's 25. Case Keenum's going to be 30, or I think he already is 30. So look at it this way. Both guys are out of contracts. When they were cleaning out their locker rooms, reporters asked Teddy Bridgewater what next season holds for him if he's going to be back, and he said he doesn't know what the future holds. If you're a player in the NFL, and if you've listened to what these players say, usually if they want to be back, it's either, yeah, I hope the team brings me back, or I would love to be here. All right, Teddy Bridgewater didn't say that. He said he doesn't know what his future holds. That's saying, you know what, maybe he doesn't want to be with the Vikings going forward. And I think that has to do with the fact that they activated Sam Bradford to be the backup quarterback instead of Teddy Bridgewater in that NFC Championship game. All right, so, I mean, Teddy Bridgewater's got to look out for Teddy Bridgewater. So let's say, I mean, Case Keenum goes to the Giants. You're going to have to pay Teddy Bridgewater a bit or else he's going to go to a different team. Because, I mean, why would you want to go to a team where, I mean, they didn't even activate you for the NFC Championship game. They activated Sam Bradford, who's hurt just as much as you've ever been. All right. If I had to call it right now, I say that the Vikings bring back Canem and they let Teddy Bridgewater walk. Teddy Bridgewater could end up on a team like the Jets. Safe option there. I'm not sure where else is a fit for Teddy Bridgewater, to be honest, but we're just going to have to wait and see for him. 
And you know what? I mean, now, like I said, they got to figure out what's going on at quarterback. But nonetheless, Eagles, NFC champs, everyone said they couldn't do it. I said well, as soon as Carson Wentz went down, I said the Eagles were done. But they proved me wrong, and I'm kind of happy they did. It's been fun to watch this Eagles team. One of the best all-around teams in football right now. As far as all-around goes, they're better than the Patriots. But Patriots got that whole Tom Brady guy playing quarterback. So we're just going to have to wait and see how it all ends up for them. Like I said, we're not going to be talking about the game yet, just yet, because we got two weeks to uh, marinate over it. So next up, we're going to be talking NBA from Monday. Might talk LeBron, might talk Kawhi. I don't know. I might save that for the fourth segment, so you're just going to have to wait and see. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Sports podcast. These last two segments have basically, not even basically, they've been me recapping the two um, the AFC Championship and NFC Championship games. All right, we got the Eagles playing the Patriots in the Super Bowl, and both of the losing teams in the off season looking to looking to figure out what they're going to be doing at quarterback for next season. I mean, if you're the Jags, do you bring back Blake Bortles who played all right, or do you realize that all he's going to be in his NFL life is an average quarterback? I mean, the guy did have a few good games, but that's it. If you want to. If, like I said, I've been saying, I pretty much said last week that you don't need like a top quarterback to get you to where you need to be, meaning the Super Bowl. Obviously, the Eagles have showed that, but you need someone better than Blake Bortles. All right, so I'm not sure the Gi- or the Jags should bring him back. I wouldn't if I was them, but we have to wait and see what they want to do. As far as the Vikings, you got to figure out: is it Case Keenum or Teddy Bridgewater that you want to bring back as your starting quarterback? If it's me, I'm bringing back Bridgewater. But if I had to put my money on it, they're bringing back Keenum. So we're just gonna have to wait and see about that. All right, so now we're going to be talking NBA from Monday. Let's get into it. We had the Sacramento Kings heading into Charlotte, facing off with the Hornets. And the Charlotte Hornets, Hornets pulled out the win in this one, 112-107. For the Kings, you had Willie Cauley-Stein with only 11 points, 10 rebounds in this one, shot 5 of 20, not a good game from him. De'Aaron Fox had 16 points, 7 assists, 3 rebounds. He shot 6 to 13. Pretty nice game from him. Vince Carter started in this one. Only played 19 minutes, but it's notable. He had 6 points, 3 rebounds, shot 2 of 3. 2 of 3 from the 3-point line right there. Bogdan Bogdanovich had Bogdan Bogdanovich, I think it is. 10 points, 7 assists. He only shot 3 of 10. Not a good shooting night from him. Scala Bissier off the bench. He had 23 points, 4 rebounds, shot 10 of 15. Uh, you had... George's Papagiannis, 6 points, 6 rebounds off the bench, 3 of 7. And then Buddy Hield with 18 points, 5 rebounds, shot 4 of 6 from the 3-point line, and 6 of 13 from the field. As for those Charlotte Hornets, you had Marvin Williams with 14 points. He shot 5 of 8, 3 of 5 from the 3-point line. Dwight Howard, 14 points, 16 rebounds, 4 of 8 shooting. Then you had Kemba Walker with 26 points, 6 rebounds, and 9 assists. He shot 6 of 20, 5 of 14 from the 3-point line. Nicholas Batum, 14 points, 6 rebounds, and he shot 6 of 13. All right, if I'm the Sacramento Kings right now, even a Sacramento Kings fan, I'm thinking, is there a real true um, true direction that this team is heading in? All right, obviously, it's looking like they want to go young, and I get that, but, I mean, how many seasons can you go with, like, losing? I don't understand it. Like, this is ridiculous. It's been since 2006. Every time I talk about the Kings, man, it's just always about how they're losing all the time. They're currently on an eight-game losing streak. I think they're playing the Magic tonight. I'm going to make that pick for the game um, in the fourth segment. But you should already know who I'm picking. I mean, the Kings have been bad for so long. All right? Best player they had since Weber was DeMarcus Cousins. Had him for, what, six seasons? And the Kings refused, refused to put good players around him. 
All right, fans want to say that DeMarcus Cousins doesn't make players around him better. Well, I mean, how are you going to make guys like Jimmer Fredette better? All right, I mean, it's just constantly just terrible, terrible, terrible front office moves. All right, now, I mean, like I said, they're heading in a little nice direction, I guess, with youth. I mean, you got Darren Fox. I mean, he's still developing. You're not really sure what he's going to end up being. Willie Colley-Stein shows flashes. Uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich, he's probably the Kings' best player right now. Buddy Hill, I mean, they've been treating him like an off-the-bench six-man. Uh, George Hill has no place on that team. I know they're waiting on that Papa Giannis guy, the center. I mean, they drafted him a couple years ago, I think it was. I mean, that, that, that move made no sense to me. You got Justin Jackson from North Carolina. Really hasn't done much this season. Still got to develop, I guess. Scalabissier, I mean, he's a hot and cold. Uh, Vince Carter's only there to help the rookies out. And you got Costa Kufis, who really, I mean, he's probably going to get traded at the deadline. Zach Randolph, old guy. Malachi Richardson, really no place for him on the team. And Garrett Temple is just one of those veterans that if you don't have him, then, I mean, he doesn't really matter. I mean, so you got Fox, you got Heald, Jackson, Labissier, Papa Giannis. Bogdanovich and Collie Stein. Do any of those names strike you as someone who could uh, be a star player or anything like that? Lead a team? I mean, I, I know that they're young and all that, but I mean, eventually there's got to be results. All right. I mean, what are they going to do in this draft? Draft another player that they're going to have to wait on? They got to do something to where they're going to draft a game changing player, and they haven't done that since DeMarcus Cousins. I'm not sure if they're even capable of doing that. All right. I mean, no free agent wants to go to Sacramento. You really don't have much to trade. You don't have much to offer to get a nice player from someone else. I mean, it's just ridiculous how bad the Kings have been for so long. I mean, fans, radio hosts, all those people out there that support the Kings. I mean, how how much longer can you accept this losing? It's ridiculous. Kings are currently 13-33, and 33, the worst team in the league by far. I mean, it's just, I don't get it. As for the Hornets, I think Michael, I believe Michael Jordan came out and said that they're not looking to trade Kemba Walker right now. I know that's good for Kemba Walker and he's happy about it, but I mean, if you're Charlotte, I mean, Kemba Walker isn't making you any better than you, that, than what you'd be without him. I mean, yeah, they'd probably be worse, but I mean, how much worse, honestly, could you get? You're already a 19 and 26 team with, with him. I mean, probably what? Three more, three or four more losses worse without him. It's just a better draft pick, honestly. And Kemba Walker, I mean, I get that he likes playing in Charlotte, but I mean, you want to spend the rest of your career just losing in Charlotte? I mean, it's just been ridiculous. But those are both bad teams right there. We're going to see what the uh, Hornets do with uh, Kemba Walker. And I mean, the Kings, they're going to lose a lot of games going forward. They're probably, I doubt they'll even get to 20 wins this season. So either they hit one in the draft, hit one good on the draft, or they're just going to keep being bad. So we'll see. How it all ends up for those two teams. Next game up, we had the Utah Jazz facing off with the Atlanta Hawks. The Hawks won this one, 104-90. Jazz starting five, really didn't do anything notable in this game. Derek Favors, only 11 points, four rebounds, shot four of eight. Joe Ingles, only eight points, three assists, shot three of five. Rudy Gobert, 28 minutes in this one, only six points, did have 10 rebounds, shot two of six. Ricky Rubio has been having a terrible season, um, only two points, shot one of eight, did have four rebounds, six assists. Donovan Mitchell, not a good shooting night from him. Only 13 points, shot 5 of 13, did bring in 6 rebounds. Alright, as for the uh, Hawks, you had Torian Prince with 17 points, shot 6 of 11, 2 of 4 from the 3-point line. Dennis Schroeder, 20 points, only 2 assists, 1 rebound, shot 7 of 18 from the field. And then you had Kent Bazemore with 11 points. He shot 4 of 9, 3 of 5 from the 3-point line. Jazz, I remember reporters, the Utah Jazz reporters, fans saying that they didn't need Gordon Hayward because they had Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert, yeah, I even know he's been hurt a lot this season, but even when he's out there, the dude's been disappointing. He just hasn't been what he was last season or even the season before. That guy's been a disappointment. Yeah, you have Donovan Mitchell. That's a, I think that's going to be a cornerstone for your franchise going forward. But, I mean, other than that, the Jazz really don't have much. I think they're going to end up trading Rodney Hood at the trade deadline, so maybe they could get a first-round pick for him. But I'm not too sure about that. As for the Hawks, I mean, 14-32, and 32, the tanking is going right. I mean, they win a couple of games, they lose a bunch of games. Uh, they're going to have a nice little top five pick, I feel. So, I mean, the Hawks just got to keep this whole tank going and at least try to get a top five pick. Maybe get a guy like DeAndre Ayton or Game Changer in the draft to uh, help elevate that franchise. Next up, we had the Miami Heat facing off with the Houston Rockets. He put up a nice little fight, but the Rockets came out on top with, in this one with a 99-90 to 90 win. All right, James Johnson for Miami had 10 points, 4 assists, 3 rebounds, shot 5 of 13, 0 of 4 from the 3-point line. Josh Richardson... 
20 or 12 points, excuse me, three rebounds, shot five at 12, 204 from the three point line. Hassan Whiteside had 22 points, 13 rebounds, 11 to 16 shooting. Wayne Ellington only 13 points, five rebounds, shot four of 13, three of 11 from the three point line. Not a great game from him. Off the bench, you had Kelly Olynyk as the leading scorer with 10 points. As for the Rockets, you had Ryan Anderson with only nine points. I mean, that guy's dead weight on that team, to be honest. Trevor Reza had three points, shot one of two from the field. I think this was his first game back off the suspension. Clint Capella had 14 points, 8 rebounds, shot 6 of 10. Chris Paul, 16 points, 6 rebounds, 6 assists, uh, shot 6 of 13. And James Harden had 28 points, 5 assists, shot 10 of 26, 5 of 13 from the three-point. And then you had Aaron Go- Eric Gordon off the bench with 16 points, shot 6 of 15, 0 of 7 from the three-point line. Though, so not a great game from him. As of right now, I think the clear-cut two best teams in the West are currently the, obviously, the Golden State Warriors and then the Houston Rockets. All right. If you remember these, if you were able to catch the game on Saturday, the Rockets ended up beating the Warriors. Warriors were at four, full strength, and so were the Rockets. I mean, James Harden. There was one where he hit a disgusting step back three off of uh, Steph Curry. Poor Steph Curry, man. Great player, but just constantly always getting big shots hit on him in national television. But I mean, going forward, is this a series that we could see going seven games? It's possible, but I mean. I don't, I don't see it. I see this uh, as of right now. If these teams two were two teams were to meet in the Western Conference Finals, this game is going six games. I think Rockets will probably, yeah, Rockets pull two out of there. But I mean, they just won't be enough. They won't have enough to beat the Warriors. I'm not sure. I don't think the Rockets are going to do anything at the trade deadline. But they need something it's like a little bit more depth to bring it to seven games against the Warriors in a playoff series. Like I said, I mean, it's all speculation right now, but. I mean, yeah, these are the two best teams, but as of right now, I mean, given how the Rockets have been playing, they're still not good enough to beat the Warriors. As for the Heat, they're a nice little story. Eric Spolstra has been able to get the most out of these players. I think they're currently still the fourth seed with uh, Washington losing last night, I think it was. And Washington is just the team that's been disappointing so far this season. But, uh, I mean, the Heat, they'd probably end up facing off with the Wizards in a seven-game series. As of right now, I'd take the Heat in that series, and they'd be facing off with the Celtics in the second round. At least that's what it's looking like right now. I mean, the Heat are currently 2-1 and against the Celtics so far this season, but I don't think they'd be able to pull it out against Boston. Maybe you get a game, maybe two, if that, against the Celtics. But nonetheless, Heat are having a really good season. All right, then we had the Philadelphia 76ers facing off with the Memphis Grizzlies. Memphis won this one, 105-101. Philly is kind of in trouble. All right, you got Joel Embiid. Obviously, future superstars looking like Ben Simmons, looking like the future rookie of the year of the season. Dario Sarge is a nice play- piece. Robert Covington plays well time to time. I mean, after that, though, you still don't have a point guard. All right, we don't even know what's going to happen with Markel Fultz. I mean... It's looking, it's looking bad for honesty for the Sixers as far as Markel Fultz goes, and even if you bring him back, I mean, you can't even play him and Simmons together. I think the Sixers honestly really botched this draft. All right, they shouldn't have traded with the Celtics. All right, they could have ended up. I mean, I know the Celtics took a um, took Tatum, or said they were going to take Tatum with the number one pick either way, but I mean, taking Fultz. I'm not sure if it's Philly that ruined him or it's just in his head now, but they got to figure something out because if not, I mean, this is going to be an all-time blunder and this is going to set them back a bit as far as that rebuild goes. All right, so like I said, I mean, Dario Saric in this one, he had 22 points, shot 7 of 11, 3 of 4 from the three-point line, 10 rebounds. Covington had 18 points, 6 rebounds, shot 5 of 14, 4 of 11 from the three-point line. Joel Embiid, 15 points, 14 rebounds, shot 5 of 13. Then you had Timothy Luau Carboo. With 20 points, he shot 6 of 9 from the field, 6 of 8 from the 3-point line. And then you had Ben Simmons with only 6 points, shot 3 of 8, 3 rebounds, 7 assists. As for those Memphis Grizzlies, you had Dylan Brooks with only 7 points, shot 2 of 7. Marc Gasol, 19 points, 6 rebounds, shot 6 of 14. Tyreek Evans, 18 points, 4 rebounds, 8 assists, shot 6 of 16. I think Tyreek Evans is going to end up getting traded to some contender. He's going to be a nice little piece for someone going forward at the trade deadline, I feel. All right, that's how that ended up. Once again, the Grizzlies won 105-101 against the Sixers. And then you had the Phil- or the Phoenix Suns facing off with the Milwaukee Bucks. I think this was, this was the Bucks' first game without, um, yeah, it was the first game without Jason Kidd. I think he was fired yesterday, I believe. So yeah, break you're not even breaking news, but just letting you guys know, Jason Kidd was fired as the Milwaukee Bucks head coach. Milwaukee won this game against Phoenix in Milwaukee 109-105. 
You had TJ Warren for Phoenix with 23 points, shot 11 of 20. Greg Monroe, 19 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists. He shot 9 of 11. Tyler Ulis played 15 points in this one, didn't take a shot. Only had 2 assists, no rebounds. Devin Booker, poor shooting game from him. Only 14 points, 8 assists, uh, 4 rebounds. He shot 2 of 14, 1 of 6 from the 3-point line. As for those Bucks, no Giannis Antetokounmpo in this game. You had Chris Middleton, though, explode for 35 points, 6 rebounds, 3 assists, shot three, 13 of 19. Eric Bledsoe, 19 points, 7 assists, 3 rebounds, shot 6 of 13. Then you have Malcolm Brogdon with 32 points, 4 rebounds, shot 11 of 14, and 3 of 4 from the 3-point line. We're going to see what Milwaukee does for the rest of the season. I'm not sure they're going to bring in a new head coach. They'll probably stick with the interim one they got right now. And I mean, I think this is just another wasted season for the Bucks. As for the Chicago Bulls, they faced off with the New Orleans Pelicans. The New Orleans Pelicans won this one in double overtime, 132-128. For the Chicago Bulls, you had Laurie Markkinen with 14 points, 17 rebounds, shot 5 of 12. Robin Lopez, 22 points, only 4 rebounds. Jeremy Grant, 22 points, 13 assists, shot 6 of 7. Yeah, shot 6 of 7. Zach Levine, 19 points, 5, of 5 rebounds, shot 7 of 15. Justin Holiday with 15 points, 7 rebounds. Then off the bench, you had Nikolai Miritich with 14 points, 4 rebounds, shot 4 of 10, and 2 of 7 from the 3-point line. As for those Pelicans, both DeMarcus Cousins and Anthony Davis had great games, but Davis was overshadowed by DeMarcus Cousins. Cousins had 44 points, 24 rebounds, 10 assists. Triple-double, first player to have those kind of numbers since 2010, I believe. Shot 13 of 29, 5 of 11 from the 3-point line. Anthony Davis, like I said, had a great game. 34 points, 5 assists, 9 rebounds, shot 14 of 23. Did get fouled out, but nonetheless, they pulled out the win. Rajon Rondo, only 15 minutes in this one, 5 points, 2 assists, shot 2 of 6, 1 of 4 from the 3-point line. Drew Holiday, 12 points, 6 assists, 4 rebounds, shot 5 of 17. And then you add Etwan Moore with uh, 15 points, 5 rebounds, shot 6 of 15, 2 of 6 from the 3-point line. All right, we had the Washington Wizards facing off with the Dallas Mavericks. Dallas won this one, 98-75. Just a garbage game from the Wizards, if I'm being completely honest. John Wall, only 11 points, shot 4 of 15. Bradley Beal, only 18 points, shot 4 of 14. Uh, Otto Porter, only 4 points, shot 2 of 8. Didn't hit a three in that one. As for the Mavericks, you had Harrison Barnes with 20 points, shot 9 of 16, had 10 rebounds also. Dennis Smith Jr., who's going to be in the dunk contest, had 17 points, 6 assists, shot 7 of 16. Wesley Matthews, 14 points, 3 rebounds, shot 5 of 12. Um, next game up, we had the Portland Trailblazers facing off with the Denver Nuggets. Denver pulled out the win in this one, 104-101. Uh, Damian Lillard with only 25 points, 8 assists, shot 10 of 18. CJ McCollum, only 12 points, shot 3 of 14, 0 of 3. For the Trailblazers, I think Damian Lillard's going to end up leaving sometime soon. I mean, he's just wasting his career there, if we're being honest. But Joseph Nurkic, he had 19 points, 12 rebounds, shot 7 of 13 for the Trailblazers. As for the Nuggets, you had Nikolai Jokic with 16 points, 12 rebounds, 5 assists, shot 5 of 17. Mason Plumlee, Plumlee 11 points, 7 rebounds. Jamal Murray, 38 points, 6 assists, 5 rebounds, shot 14 of 19, 4 or 6 from the 3-point line. Will Barton, 7 points, didn't hit a shot from the field though, had 8 rebounds. And Gary Harris, poor shooting night from him, but didn't matter since the Nuggets pulled out the win. He had 13 points, shot 4 of 14. As for the final game of the night, we had the Minnesota Timberwolves facing off with the LA Clippers. All right, Timberwolves won this one, 126-118. Taj Gibson, 14 points, 6 rebounds. Andrew Wiggins, probably the best game of the season for him, 40 points, 6 rebounds, shot 16 of 28. Jeff T, 30 points, 7 of 14 shooting. No, uh... Jimmy Butler in this one, and Carl Anthony Towns had a bad game, only 11 points. Did have 17 rebounds, but only shot 1 of 7. As for the Clippers, you had Blake Griffin with 32 points, 12 rebounds, 12 assists, triple-double right there, 13 of 22 shooting for the game. Milos Tedosic had 15 points, 6 assists, and then off the bench, you had Montrez Harrell with 23 points, 6 rebounds, shot 8 of 13, and Lou Williams with 20 points, 7 assists, shot 8 of 15. Once again, no DeAndre Jordan, currently still out with a sprained left ankle. Like I said, that was the last game of the night. So next up, we're going to be making my picks for the games going on for Tuesday. And we're going to be talking Spurs and we're going to be talking Cavs. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right. Uh... 
of that last segment, we talked about the NBA games from Monday night. This segment, we're going to be making my picks for the games going on Tuesday night. We got Celtics Lakers, we got Kings Magic, Nets Thunder, Cavaliers Spurs, Knicks Warriors, and yeah, those are the games going on tonight. But, you know what, speaking of those Cavs, let's start off with them. This whole drama, saga, whatever you want to call it, is getting really exhausting, honestly. All right. Adrian Wojnarowski, the ESPN reporter, tweeted out that King or the Cavs had another uh, team meeting. Kevin Love was called out in this one. They didn't like how uh, he left. I think it was what Sunday's game, Saturday's game, with an illness. Didn't play after that. They called it out. Didn't think it was too real or anything like that. But I mean, yeah, it's cool for a guy like Derrick Rose to take two months off because he doesn't know if he wants to play basketball, right, Cleveland? So this whole situation, I mean, has just become ridiculous, all right? And you know what? I think it's starting to turn LeBron James back into the villain. And it's just it's just ridiculous, honestly. Like, I get LeBron probably hasn't played a complete part in all of this, but, I mean, he's been doing a lot of complaining. And just pretty much, I mean, when they asked him about Tyron Lue, as far as is his job safe, I mean, that's your coach right there. And LeBron really didn't say anything meaningful about it. Didn't give him a vote of confidence or anything like that. I mean, you could tell, like, LeBron LeBron thinks that he's done nothing wrong and it's everyone else's fault. All right, and I'm starting to see that and it's starting to get a little tiring, honestly. I mean, LeBron, I've always respected him, always enjoyed watching him play, but, I mean, now it's starting to get a bit ridiculous. All right, LeBron needs to start holding himself accountable. Whenever reporters ask him about defense, he always gets so defensive. And that's kind of ironic because that's the only defense he really does um, really plays right there is when he's being asked questions about his actual defense in the in the game. But I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you don't even guard the best player on the opposing team, and you want to go call out other players, right? I've been seeing that Isaiah Thomas really hasn't been fitting in with that team, and that whole thing might have to do with the fact that Isaiah Thomas called out the Cavs. He said there's no effort and they're not trusting each other, and brought up when he was back in Boston that wasn't the case, and everyone put in effort. I'm sure LeBron didn't like that. But, like, LeBron's starting to turn into a player who can't handle criticism, I feel. All right, he's really starting to turn into the villain that he was before. And it's just ridiculous for the Cavs. I mean, how are you going to call out Kevin Love? I mean, Kevin Love, yeah, he like, it's the whole team. They need to hold themselves accountable. There's too many selfish players on that team. Guys like J.R. Smith, Tristan Thompson, I mean, those guys aren't playing defense. Tristan Thompson's not the rebounder that he was the last few years. J.R. Smith can't hit a shot to save his life. All right, Kevin Love, I mean, if you don't be mad at him, LeBron turned him into this, all right? LeBron, I mean, when Kevin Love got there, he rolled diminished extremely, all right? Remember the player um, Kevin Love was in at Minnesota? Never would turn to being that player again because LeBron just has him sit on the, on the corner of the three-point line waiting to catch the ball and shoot. That's it. Kevin Love, when they brought him over, should have been someone that they should have played through. All right, and you know what's hurting them the most is not having Kyrie Irving. You don't have a go-to scorer or a guy that could create his own shot. I mean, everyone thought Isaiah Thomas was going to be that, but the guy hasn't even looks like doesn't even look like he's one hundred percent yet and hasn't got his legs back. All right, it just makes no sense to me. I think Kevin Love is going to end up getting traded. It's either going to be him or Isaiah Thomas. I feel, and either way, I mean, you trade one of those guys, it's not going to fix anything. Bring in DeAndre Jordan. Who cares? He's not going to help you uh, play defense on the perimeter. All right, yeah, he's going to help you with rebounding, but nonetheless, you still have no one who can play defense on any of these wing players. So, I mean, the, as far as the whole Cavs drama goes, this is it for them. All right, they're not winning. They're not going to the finals. LeBron, I'm not sure if he's leaving. If I'm him, I'd probably end up going to Houston or San Antonio, but nonetheless, I'm not sure if he's leaving, but it's just that's not because he loves Cleveland, all right? Let's get that through our heads, all right? Cleveland is nothing special, okay? He's only not going to leave because he's not going to want to go to L.A. where he'll just lose to the Warriors constantly. I mean, the only chance he has at beating the Warriors is going to Houston or uh, San Antonio. The East is starting to shift. It's the, it's the um, Raptors and Celtics conference right now. All right, we got to stop this whole, oh, LeBron put this all in the Cavs. They're not, they're not done. They do this every year. This is different, all right? LeBron isn't invincible. Best player in the league? Yeah, but, I mean, not making anyone around him better, honestly, this season like he's done before. All right, so there's that. And now we got the Spurs. Kawhi doesn't like how the Spurs have been handling his injury. Kawhi wants to sit out more, and I think there's problems with him and the Spurs right now, and you really never see that. It's honestly kind of interesting to see how this will all play out. I mean, it's kind of weird, honestly. I mean, Kawhi's been a real kept-to-himself player, and you got Adrian Wojnarowski tweeting out that from his camp, his little entourage, I guess, that they're not happy, and Kawhi's not happy with how it's been handled. So, I mean, what's going to happen with Kawhi? I've been seeing people throwing around the whole trade rumor type of thing. I don't see it happening, but Spurs better get it together. I mean... 
They're not the New England Patriots. You can't just throw someone else in there. This is the NBA. You need a top player like Kawhi Leonard in order to compete with the Warriors and uh, Rockets. So I'm not really sure what's going on too much with this whole situation. I think it's still a free-flowing type of thing. But from the Spurs, let Kawhi do whatever he wants to do. And when he's ready to come back, he's ready to come back. All right, but let's talk NBA games for Tuesday night. Let's make some picks. All right, we got the Kings facing off with the Magic, two of the worst teams in the league. Kings are by far the worst. Magic are currently favored by 6.5 in this one. I'm going with the Magic. I mean, the Kings really haven't shown that they can compete or play well against any team in the league, so I got the Magic winning in this one. Next up, we got the Brooklyn Nets facing off with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Thunder have been playing good basketball as of late, currently 26-20, and 16-7 and 7 at home. Nets are 18-14 and 14 on the road, so I got the Thunder in this one. They're currently favored by 10. Then we got the Cleveland Cavaliers facing off with the San Antonio Spurs. I'm not sure who to pick in this one. I'm going to go... I'm going to go with the Spurs. They're currently one of the best home teams in the league, currently 19 and 3. 19 and 3. Cavaliers are currently 11 and 12 on the road. They got a bunch of problems they got to fix and I don't think um, they're going to win tonight. So I got the Spurs winning that one. That one's on TNT also. So we're going to get to see this nationally televised drama from the Cavs. All right. And then for the second to last game of the night, we got the New York Knicks facing off with the Golden State Warriors. This is the easiest game to pick of the night. I got the Warriors winning that one, beating the Knicks. Knicks might put up a tiny bit of a fight for about two minutes into the first quarter. After that, it's going to be all Warriors. I can bet you that. And for the final game of the night, we got the biggest rivalry in the NBA. It used to be the biggest rivalry in the NBA. I know ESPN likes to hop, hype up uh, Cavs and Warriors as one of the biggest rivalries of all time in the NBA. And I don't get that. I mean, Cleveland's only been good for about since LeBron got there. So we got the Celtics facing off with the Lakers. That's the true biggest rivalry in the history of the NBA. Don't ever get it twisted. All right, that's going to be the second game on TNT. No Alonzo Ball, Celtics' best defensive team in the league. Currently 16-5 and on the road. Lakers 11-14 on the road. Don't got to tell me twice. Celtics are winning this one. Alonzo Ball is out there. I might be kind of hesitant, but, I mean, I don't think there's any point guard out there that could help make these players around them better, especially against the best defense in the league. So I got the Celtics in that one. I'm sure Kyrie Irving is probably just relishing the fact that he's not going through all the drama that's going on in Cleveland right now. So once again, to recap, I got the Magic beating the Kings, the Thunder beating the Nets, the Spurs beating the Cavs, the Warriors beating the Knicks, and the Celtics knocking off the Lakers. All right, that's going to be it for today's show. I'm going to recap. First up, we talked about the AFC Championship game, talked about how the Patriots have pretty much been dominant for so long and how they've pretty much made the league unfair and uh, everyone's ex expectations of excellence were unrealistic. Then we talked about the Vikings and uh, Eagles game in the second segment, talked about what the Vikings are going to be doing at quarterback next season, talked about how the Eagles are one of the best all-around teams in the league. Third segment, we talked about the games from last night, and for this fourth one, we talked uh, Cavs drama, we talked Spurs, and we made my picks for the games going on tonight. So once again, that's going to wrap it up for the GSMC Sports Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jesse Tapia. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow, so stay tuned, and we'll talk to you later. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program